Hello Astrotometry. This is a video on understanding the relationship between multiple coronal mass ejections and the tropical cyclones that are observed on the Earth in their hypersymmetric relationships. And to understand this video, um, these videos you're going to want to familiarize yourself with first. Um, these are the, the concepts that are necessary, <clears throat> especially the concept of a pneuma. We have to understand that there's this relationship between the sun and the sort of prevailing wind on the earth. There's a, a relationship between the way that the wind moves and the way that the, um, what, we, what in astrotometry is called the common carrier, changes uh, through hypertime. In other words, it's the hypertime translation, the tendency of the hypertime translation that is changed when multiple coronal mass ejections interfere with one another. And rather than resort to the uh, hypertime geometry that I haven't I haven't even uh, finalized yet. I'm going to give a sort of uh, conceptual abstraction for how this can be sorted out to understand the relationship between uh, the coronal mass ejection and the way a second coronal mass ejection affects it uh, with respect to the uh, formation of the tropical uh, cyclones. And so, if you consider the Earth. Um, and the sun, <clears throat> make the sun pink. And if you consider a, a, a mass ejection that comes out of the sun, like this last one, looked fairly like, like a fairly large coronal mass ejection uh, comes out of the sun, has a, has a, a fairly large mass, maybe looks like there's a, a, a cyclonic shape to it. Um, and when it's as calm as it's been, um, normally we wouldn't see uh, a second coronal mass ejection so quickly. But in, in this case, in this last case, there were two more. Um, there was one that came out here. Um, before the effect of this one finished, before the effect of this coronal mass ejection was seen, uh, we had, uh, I think it was Dijon or something like that, um, uh, cyclone formed on, on the Earth. and What's happening is this point in hypertime is the sort of is this pneuma. There's this sort of invisible line uh, that runs through time and space from this point to this point. And if you think about the direction that the wind is going in a cyclone, if you were if you were in a cyclone, if you were at the at the eye, if you were in the center, the the wind is spiraling. There's like this spiraling wind that is is the uh, the way. That this, that this forms. Now, if you consider this as a force, if you consider the ejection itself as a sort of force, where you have the right-hand rule uh, that's taken hyper, hyperspatially over the entire, over the entire area, um, that, um, that spiral and that force are related. Now, when you have a second coronal mass ejection that is ejected before the influence of this ejection is realized in the form of the cyclone, this point moves, that direction moves. And so you get, you get this point shifts over to a different point and it has to start over forming uh, in a different point. And so there's, there's a, a relationship between the, the consistency of this, uh, this force that has, as it relates to the actual hypertime uh, map See, the issue is that the, the hypertime map is going to be uh, incredibly difficult to work out because of the nature of the way that the Earth propagates through time itself, um, which is not um, in a single dimension. And so we're going to have to sort the hypertime mappings out by looking at these points and how they change through time. That's that's going to be the that's going to be the only real well, that's going to be one of the really good data points that we have, um, where the where the, uh, the the particular uh, time that the sun was and where these things uh, actually relate to on the physical structure of the Earth, and so the the this this second ejection happened, and then there was also a third ejection. So we don't know. Um, it would be nice to know. This is one of the flaws. This is one of the, the uh, drawbacks uh, in using astrotometry uh, to try to predict her pains. It's not, it's not clearly not a, a, a fatal flaw. And what I suspect that we're going to find out 
um, it's it's definitely very still very useful to uh, to do the storm prediction. But what I suspect we're going to find out is I suspect that the foreshadow of this event might actually even be represented in the structure of this of uh, this mass ejection. In other words, if you look at the shapes of these ejections, they're very, very different. They have very, very different signatures. And what I suspect we're going to find out is that the shape itself, the shape of this ejection itself, may indicate whether or not it's going to be interrupted uh, in hypersymmetrically um, with another ejection. And so I think as we look at these, look, look more at these, I think we'll figure out more uh, how the um, the particular forms relate to different to different storm shapes, and so I hope that helps. I know that there were a few of you that were kind of struggling. Um, I I know that um, Justin had predicted that there, this would be a Category Five this this last this last thing, and I think it it could have been a, a very large uh, tropical cyclone had there had it not been interrupted by this other by this other. Um, other rejection. So and so, if you think about what I'm saying, if this, if the, all of this energy had had been left in one this one storm, rather than it moving into a different into a different one, um, it, this this form shifting into a different place, um, this could have been a much larger storm. But as it turned out, there was there was a sort of shift in this in this pneuma, the in the source of the of, of the prevailing wind. And so that's the key if you want to if you want to understand it. And if you, anybody wants to tackle the hypertime geometry for this, um, <laughs> I would really be interested in seeing that. So take care. Bye.